the reduction of alkynes. It's going to be the topic in this lesson. And this is the first set of reactions for alkynes we're going to cover. And we're going to find out that they're going to be very analogous to some of the addition reactions we learned for alkenes. And so typically my pattern is going to be I'm going to present the reaction you already learned for alkenes and then show you the similar reactions for alkynes. This lesson's part of my new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one or any of my future playlists, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification, you'll be notified every time I present a new lesson. All right, so reduction of alkynes. It turns out we've got three different relevant reactions that are all considered reduction of alkynes, whereas with alkenes, we only had one relevant reduction. So again, we're going to start back with that relevant reduction of alkenes. We'll see that we have an analogous reaction with alkynes and then another couple other reactions and alternative ways of, of performing something similar. All right, so for alkenes, you guys learned that when you add H2 with a, an appropriate metal catalyst like palladium, platinum, or nickel, here I'm using palladium on carbon or palladium on charcoal, however you want to look at it. And in this case, it adds an H to both sides of the alkene, effectively reducing it to an alkane. And if you form chiral centers at both of the carbons that were sp2 that become sp3, so then you're supposed to remember that this is a syn addition. In this case, it wouldn't really matter for this product. So neither of these two new sp3 carbons are chiral centers, so it didn't matter at all. Uh, but it is a syn addition if it matters, and it will matter when we reference this back to alkynes here in a little bit. So, But this is one of the reactions you learned. Uh, we don't completely know everything about this mechanism, which is a great thing, because that means that you don't have to know the mechanism. Now, the analogous reaction for alkynes starts back over here and use the same exact reagents, H2 and an appropriate metal catalyst, like again, palladium, platinum, or nickel. And the key difference here is that now we have two pi bonds and the reaction occurs twice. You actually add two equivalents of H2. So add hydrogen across the alkyne twice. The first converts it into an alkene and then the alkene turns into the alkane. So it turns out that you can't really stop this halfway by like limiting how much hydrogen you're at or something like that. We have to actually get creative. So however, it turns out that the process of turning the alkyne to the alkene is more exothermic than turning the alkene into the alkane. And because of that, because that first step is more exothermic, we can actually poison our catalyst to such a way that the catalyst will still be reactive enough to react with the more exothermic alke uh, alkyne reaction, but not reactive enough to, to perform the alkene reaction. And ultimately, it's going to stop us at the alkene, as we'll see here. So uh, here we're going to use what's called Linlar's catalyst. And Linlar's catalyst is the most common example of what we call a poisoned catalyst. And what we put on there, we take our palladium, so same palladium we we're using up here, but we're going to add some barium sulfate to it. Some people use calcium carbonate and some quinoline onto it. And it turns out these are going to decrease the reactivity of that catalyst. And so in this case, we start with all al kind once again. And now we're going to add H2. And some people will write all this out as the catalyst, but most of the time you're probably just going to see it written as Linlar's. So if you see H2 and like, you know, regular palladium or platinum or nickel, that's supposed to reduce it all the way to an alkane. But if you see H2 and like palladium and a whole bunch of other stuff, you're supposed to be like, oh, a whole bunch of other stuff, a whole bunch of crap with my palladium, that's Linlar's catalyst. But again, most of you are going to see it written like this instead, just H2 and Linlar's. And this reduces it to a cis alkene if it matters. So if I start with a terminal alkyne, it wouldn't have mattered. So, but with an internal alkyne, yeah, you're going to get the cis alkene, not the trans, because once again, this is a syn addition, just like it was uh, for alkenes there. So cool. So we get this lovely cis alkene and then it stops because the Linlar's catalyst is not reactive enough to react with the alkene once it forms. And that's how we actually limit this to only going once. Now, it turns out that Linlar's catalyst is not the only example of a poisoned catalyst, but it is by far the most common uh, poisoned catalyst. And for most of you, it's going to be the only poisoned catalyst you ever see. So if you've got a couple other you learn, my apologies for not covering them. But like I said, the vast majority of you are never going to see the other poisoned catalysts. So but just an FYI to, to the select few of you, there are a couple others out there. Uh, all right, so we've got one other version of this to talk about, and it's called dissolving metal reduction. Cool, and somebody said, hey, you know, 
we know how to make the cis -al uh, alkene from the alkyne. It would be great if we could make the trans alkene as well. And it turns out we can. And it is not going to be a hydrogenation reaction at all. It's not going to involve molecular hydrogen at all at all. It's going to involve dissolving metal. And the metal we typically use is sodium, though lithium and potassium also work. And we dissolve it in a solution of liquid ammonia. Cool. And this allows us to get the transalkene instead of the cisalkene. Now we'll talk about how this works and why it works in just a second. So, but this is important. We now can start with the same alkyne and you've got three alternative reductions. You can reduce it all the way to an alkane. You can reduce it just to a cisalkene or now also just to a transalkene. And knowing these really well, so is something that, you know, uh, typically required on the exam because they can start you with the same reactant and expect you to predict one of three different products depending on which reagents we give you. All right, so how does this work? Why does this end up as a transalkene? So we're going to dive into the mechanism a little bit, but note, a lot of you won't be on the hook for this mechanism, but some of you will. So, but at the very least, it is instructive for pointing out why we get this transalkene instead. All right, so sodium's got one valence electron. In fact, this is elemental sodium. It's not sodium ions. Oftentimes, we'll even write sodium zero here to indicate that it's in the zero oxidation state, not the plus one state. So it's still got its valence electron here. And what happens here is sodium's going to donate that valence electron to one of the alkyne carbons. So I'll make it the one on the right here. And then the triple bond is going to undergo homolytic cleavage where one electron goes to the left and one goes to the right. So we're going to form a lone pair on this carbon combined with the other electron from sodium and then a radical on this one right here. So we got a lone pair here, negative charge, and a radical here. And so the major important intermediate in these dissolving metal reductions is a radical anion. And this radical anion, it turns out, so the orbital that the lone pair is in here and the orbital that this radical in here, this radical and intermediate is most stable when these point 180 degrees apart so that the electrons are as far apart as possible. And that's going to happen when these methyl groups are trans. That way, these are trans, if you will. And that's what actually is the reason for why we're going to end up with this trans product. Now, we're not quite done with this reaction here. So here's where ammonia is going to get involved in the process. We'll draw in a molecule of ammonia. And we're going to come and use this lone pair to deprotonate ammonia. Still got a radical there, but here at this carbon, we just picked up a hydrogen, so it's no longer an anion. It's got a hydrogen there. We're not typically going to draw it in. And we also just formed a molecule of NH2 minus here. Cool. And then we'll kind of repeat this sequence over again. We'll take another sodium atom and we will have it donate its electron now to the other carbon so that we get a lone pair there and make him the anion. And then he'll go get protonated from another ammonia molecule. We'll form another amide ion in the end. But there's our final product, the transalkene. Cool, like I said, most of you are probably not gonna be on the hook for this mechanism. And even for those of you that this mechanism is presented in your course, it's probably the least likely mechanism to show up on your exam out of any in this chapter. Does that mean it has a 0% chance of showing up on your exam in that case? Well, not zero, but again, it's just the least likely. All right, one last thing to note about this that's super tricky. If you recall, we've seen a reagent that looks similar to this, but is different. And we learned that if we've got a terminal alkyne, that they are acidic enough that if you use sodium amide, you will deprotonate it essentially 100% converting it into an acetylide ion. And when students are memorizing their reagents, they often get these two confused because they memorize them you know, in, in words. They say NaNH2 is my reagent, whereas here they say NaNH3. And notice NaNH2 is a single compound. It's sodium amide. Sodium's plus ions, amide is the minus ions, and so it's a single ionic compound. But NaNH3, when they say it here, it still sounds like one compound, but it's two substances here. It's elemental sodium, and then liquid ammonia, NaNH3, but it sounds very similar. And to make it even more complicated here, 
It turns out when we're using sodium amide, we often don't write it, but technically this reaction is taking place in liquid ammonia as well. And then all of a sudden it looks even more similar, but you really want to keep these two separate. Sodium and liquid ammonia is different than sodium amide, NaNH2, to serve two different purposes. Uh, again, when we're reacting with alkyne. So make sure you've got those straight. Now, if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to help promote the channel. If you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Now, if you're looking for the study guides that go with this lessons, or if you're looking for practice problems, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. There's a 168 page set of study guides. There are over 800 practice questions and counting. And brand new to the course, I'm just completing a brand new rapid review, final exam review for OCHEM 1, and I'll do an analogous set for OCHEM 2 in the spring.